So what we're, we're just going to get into it. I'm going to kind of tell you what we're going to do first. We're going to look at defining LGBTQQI. There's going to be more letters, don't worry. We're going to, there is a vocabulary quiz at the beginning of this program. You will be quizzed. It is pass-fail. Hopefully none of you will fail. We'll see. Um, understanding how LGBTQQI fits into diversity. Examining homophobia and homonegativity and its impact on campus community. Understanding the need for creating safe spaces for LGBT students and understanding really how to best address the needs of LGBT students. Um, and I'm really going to focus again on the library's role in this. Okay? So let's go on and start with our vocabulary quiz. Your sheets won't help you at all, so don't, don't look for cheat sheets, okay? I did that on purpose. All right. So, yeah, you notice LGBTQQI expanded. All right, so let's see um, what we can do with this. L, lesbian. G, gay. B, bisexual. T number one, transgender. T number two, transsexual. Okay, so far. Now here we go. This is usually where people stop. T number three. <laughs> At least you're guessing. No, it's fine. Two spirit. T number three is two spirit. Two spirit is actually a Native American term traditionally used um, with Native American cultures, some other cultures. Um, and it looks at, it was traditionally their shamans, their medicine people, um, and other members of the tribe were considered to be very wise, and they embodied both masculine and feminine qualities. And that's what's considered two-spirit. First Q. Queer. Um, it's okay to use that word. People are a little apprehensive to use that word sometimes. Um, that's a generational issue. Uh, the term queer is probably not okay to use with a person who is probably over the age of 35. The reason is for so long that was such a derogatory term that it was not okay to use it. Um, queer, the younger generation of LGBT people are really re-embracing that word as an empowerment word. And they are fine with the use of that word. Now when in doubt, I always say ask. Um, so queer... The second cue, Question. questioning. Um, I. Intersex. Yes, intersex or intersex condition. What's the um, intersex the new word for? Hermaphrodite. Right. It replaced hermaphrodite. And hermaphrodite um, or now intersex condition is someone who has both qualities of male and female when they're born. One may be more prominent than the other, and usually at birth, they are deter it's determined by the doctor and the parent what's the gender of the child going to be. It's actually not recommended now that you do that. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Um, it's actually recommended until about 13 or 14 you don't determine the gender of the child. Because if you determine you want a boy, and then and the child hits puberty, and then estrogen starts to flow, you've got a conflict um, of body and identity. So it's recommended that you don't do that. P. P is pansexual. All right. Pansexual. Pansexual and bisexual get people kind of caught up a lot. Bisexuality is you're attracted to men and women, and you're very much aware of who you are attracted to. I'm attracted to a man. I'm attracted to a woman. Pansexuality is I'm attracted to people. I don't really look at gender as a means of being attracted to someone. I'm just attracted to who you are as a person. And it doesn't matter male, female. It's not an issue. Okay, there should really be two A's up here. So let's go with the first A. Ally. So that is someone who is traditionally not a member of the LGBT community. They are usually straight. 
Um, they can be LGBT, but usually they're straight um, or heterosexual, and someone who serves as an advocate or helps or just listens um, to people. And then there's the second A, which is not up here. What's the second A? <laughs> we don't include them in our community. There are those. Asexual. What would an asexual person be? Without attraction. They're not really attracted to men or women. There's no sexual attraction in any way, shape, or form. There's no romantic attraction um, to men or women. So that's our asexual population. Okay. I put this second bullet up here is why can't there just be one or two words to describe the population? Because I actually got asked by a staff member here, why can't you people, and I stopped and caught my words for a few moments at that point, just go by one or two words. Like why can't you just use queer and cover everybody? And my response to that is, if I went around this room and I asked all of you, how do you identify? And you could be sexual orientation, but it could be everything else. How do you identify? Do you identify as strong, confident, all these other things that make you who you are? What if I told you you could only use one word? And you all had to agree on that word. How long do you think that would take? I'm pretty sure none of us would still be around for that. It's the same premise. You start negating a portion of a person's identity when you start making them have to be one thing. And you don't and what happens is you start looking at it um, as you start oversimplifying a person and who they are. It's kind of like an iceberg. And I put these up here as very loose examples that if someone told you these, you could figure it out. Don't assume gender, but if someone told you gender, all right, I now know that. And the reason I say don't assume gender is we have a large percentage of our student population that are what are considered androgynous. So you, they're may, they may be male, they may be female, and until they tell you, you don't really know. Because they may the way they dress, you're like, oh, okay, I don't know. Don't assume. Race, ethnicity, again, that's not something you assume. And never assume that a person sexual, of a person's sexual orientation. So you get caught up in this, and if a person tells you this, then it's fine. Then now you know it. But then you have everything else. Do you like to go hiking? Are you outdoorsy? Are you athletic? You know, until you get to really know a person, there's all this other stuff that stays hidden that you never know about them. And what if I told you, you can use one word and it has to sum you up as an individual? Anybody got a good one for them? Iceberg. No, I'm iceberg? I'm an iceberg. No. There you go. You could use that. Uh, but that's, that's the analogy I use with people and helping them understand really why you can't do that. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, why did hermaphrodite change to intersex? Um, in the animal community, it's still hermaphrodite. They, what they wanted to do is distinguish the human species from the other animal species, and so they changed it to intersex. Right, right, right. And if you look at other animal species, and they look, they're hermaphroditic species. Um, and so in human species, they're intersex or intersex conditions. And it makes it easier for a person to talk about, I am intersex, that I'm hermaphroditic. And people, it's kind of like the same per principle between why did they change sexually transmitted diseases to sexually transmitted infections? You don't say sexually transmitted diseases any longer, they're sexually transmitted infections. Because a disease is something that has this negative stigma and connotation associated. Infections imply something that's a little more, something we can talk about. And there's these stigmas around words that people use. And it's the same type of principle that was done with that. Okay, that's a good question though. So, in your packet...
first two pages actually, um, we're going to go through this, and I'll help you understand it. And I'm going to go through it and help you understand it from the library's standpoint. <laughs> One other thing is, in college student development, there are theories of how people develop across the board. Okay? You name a group, and there's a theory of how they develop and why they develop the way they do. Well, we're going to talk to you about gay and lesbian identity development. This is the most widely accepted. There are other models, like Fassinger's model um, and some Diagelli's model. We're going to give you this one because it's the most simple to understand, and it's the most widely accepted at this point. Okay? One thing, though, I will, will talk to you about is one of the things that may occur to you in your role is if you're working with a student or a patron or someone in your role, they may get really comfortable with you. It may take a little while, but they'll get really comfortable with you, and then they may come up to you and go, you know, I need to talk to you about something. And they decide that you're a safe person to talk to. And you may be the person they decide to come out to at that point in time. And some people's first reaction is, why me? Well, just because you were there and you were nice to them. And you were safe. That's why. There's no rhyme or reason to that. And keep in mind, though, your reaction to that first initial, if you show shock on your face, if you say anything such as, or you say, such as anything as disgust or anything like that, you've officially put that person back in the closet and you've shut them down and you don't know for how long. This person may never talk to, another, to anyone else for a long time. So I just want to caution you with that. Mainly because coming out is a lifetime process because every time someone who's LGBT meets someone new, they have to go, are they, how, they have to gauge how safe are they? Do I want to tell them? Do I have to tell them? Do I even feel comfortable telling, telling them? It's not like certain other characteristics where when you come to a person, they just automatically either know or they make the assumption. Okay. So, first one is identity confusion. And this is all in your packet. Identity confusion is really getting this personalization of information regarding sexuality. Um, and in this stage, they recognize their thoughts and their behaviors as being, and I'm not going to use homosexual, I'm going to say gay. I'm going to use it as, the, as, umbrella, as an umbrella term. Um, as gay. Um, but they usually find it unacceptable. And the reason is because of the things that they've went, been through in their life. It could be either experiences they've had in the life, their life, the way they were brought up, their family values, um, their religion. It can be a lot of different things that come into play on this. So they recognize, yeah, the behavior I'm having and the thoughts I'm having are, they do identify them as gay. However, I can't be gay. So they feel it being unacceptable um, at this point in time. So they really try to redefine that. Well, it's just a phase. I didn't really mean it that way. This is really how that should have come across. They, are redef they start trying to make up and backpedal out of things that they're thinking through. But what, one thing that will happen is they really do start trying to seek out information on what it means to be gay. And that may be your first interaction with a student who's really coming up to you and trying to get some information. Because the library here has a lot of really good resources. It has some really good books on GLBT issues in general, whether it be fiction, whether it be fact. It doesn't matter. You guys have some really good resources. So a student may come up to you and say, where's your section on sexuality? And that's all they say to you. Not for you to delve any deeper at that point in time unless they want you to. And they'll let you know if they want you to. Okay? <coughs> but what happens is that may be your first interaction with the student. And let's say you're very helpful to the student and they have a positive interaction with you. They're going to keep coming back to you. And if you don't think they watch and see when you work, how many of you have had student, repeat students who come back only when you work? Think about that. So then what happens is you get into identity comparison. Well, maybe I'm gay. All right. It's a possibility. Um, 
they accept the fact that they're different, but maybe the, but what they do is they don't act out and they don't dress and they don't identify and they don't seek out groups that identify as LGBT. What they'll do is they may act out in other ways and they exhibit being different in other ways. That could be in the way they dress, that could be in other things that they do. Um, now at this point they're also beginning to accept their behavior as being gay. However, they do not accept the label. So that is not something that they are wanting to have put on them. So they may come to you in the library for the next round and say, you know, I really want something on sexuality. I'd really like to look, talk to you something more on men who have sex with men. And if you said the word, well, you're talking about something, you want some gay literature or gay something like that, it will probably shut them down. Because the label gay is not something they're ready to accept. And it's not some, even a word they probably want to hear at that point in time. Just give them the information <laughs> and go with it at that point in time. Um, because their identity, they're, it's not there. They're not at that identity point yet. Later on, during the same phase, they'll begin to grow and they'll begin to accept that identity. And the, you'll know when they do. Um, but one of the other things that they may start asking you about is things like reparative therapy or other things like how to not be gay. Let's say they use their even that label. This is where I really want you to be careful. <laughs> if they ask you for something like that, this is where I would like you to ask the question, I'll be glad to help you with that. Why is this something of interest to you? Especially if this is a student you've been seeing for a while and they've been asking all these questions. Because what happens to a student in this phase is they'll try to stop their own behavior. They try to inhibit their own behavior at this point. So this is why you hear of people who get married, have children, and people go, oh, well, they were straight, they got married, and now they're gay. No. They were always gay. But based on everything they were taught in life and everything that they went through in life, told them you can't be. So they went through this and they kept inhibiting their behavior. So they'll go through and they'll get married. They'll have children. They'll do everything that a heterosexual couple will do. And then one day they realize they can't live like that anymore. They have to be true to their identity. And even during that marriage, they may have anonymous sex, things like that. Um, but that's some of the other things that you need to look at and talk about. If a student starts talking to you about that, you are not a counselor, nor do I want any of you to be. So at that point in time, our Counseling and Testing Center here on campus can help with, with some of those feelings of self-loathing, self-worth, lack of self-worth, and things like that. And that might be a good time for you to refer at that point. And make sure you tell them it's not for who they are. It's for that you can uh, you obviously tell that they're having some issues with their own self-worth. Okay, And that's really what you're referring for. It's not their identity. You're, ref you're doing it for the other issues that they're dealing with. Yes, that is something very much that you all need to be trained as allies to do. Um, and it's, and it, but it makes, sure, but that's where I tell you, be very make sure when you preface something like that, make sure you very much preface that if a person does that, it's not for their identity. Because they are, may, or just add, if, make sure you can hone in on a behavior such as depression, anxiety, or something like that before you do that type of thing. They're having some internal issue because it's not, a, it's not an identity issue at that point in time. Where it would be totally appropriate to suggest 
it is always appropriate to suggest counseling if you see a student struggling. So. Right. This is something we work on a lot. Right. Is, is, but if you ask that type of question to a student who's just beginning to seek information, they're not they're going to they're going to run out the room. They're not going they're not going to they're not going to give you any more information. Um, students who are really beginning to seek information um, will do one of two things. They will either figure it out on their own. Or they'll go to the, they'll go to the internet, which has horrible resources, um, and they won't come back. Typically, and that's that's definitely a dilemma for us at the public services desk because even with any sort of information, a lot of times students seem afraid to ask or not ready to ask for the information they actually want on any issue, and so uh -huh. that's why we're trained to to ask you know all kinds of questions. But maybe there are delicate ways that we can yeah. you know is there is there a better way? Because if they came to me and asked that question, uh -huh. where's your section on sexuality? There is not one section. I cannot send them to one bookshelf. I can't even really send them to a floor. Right. So I'm going to have to try best as I can to figure out, are you writing a paper on abortion, and that's what you really need information on, or do you really need something else? So we have to ask those sorts of questions just to get them anywhere useful. And I agree with Kathy. That kind of conversation often will happen with student workers where they really got an in-depth issue because they it just becomes a much more intimate relationship. Oh, yeah, definitely. That and will. We end up, I mean, we end up counseling them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, relationships and career decisions and all sorts of things. Right. You can do when you're probing and you're just saying, well, here's this, these sections. We do have a safe zone, but God should uh -huh. If they see it, they can mm -hmm. always go back. Uh -huh. We end up showing them something. Right. And we're going to talk about that later. And we could, I mean, we could ask roundabout questions and see if they ask, for instance, would you like an online article or a book, which really doesn't, that's not right. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. they that's might give a little clue. I can help you find a book. I can help you find a book. And that right. question might not drive them off. But no, that would, because it's not an invasive question. Exactly. But if they feel able to give a little information in return, that might help us get them to. Uh -huh. But in terms of the counseling, I think that's that's the that's the other thing. I would love to hear more about that and the services that are that are available. And that may be more of the day long safe zone training. But uh -huh. I know for me, we're gonna we're gonna cover that. Okay. Do you all have access to the, the safe zone program? I mean, I'm not it is. Uh, if you go to the, the entire university does. Just type in safe zone, or if you go to the safe zone wellness center page, it's linked to that as well. And you all assume everything's real paper. We try to ask that question, and sometimes, yeah, we, we try to say, it, is it for a paper or a presentation? And that's sort of a general invitation to the student to either, you know, say, well, yes, or, you know, say, you know, they, they can come back however they choose. And right. it's terrible because it kind of pigeonholes what, what they're looking for in a way. It, it, it's a leading question, but it also kind of gives them an out if they want, if they're looking for personal information. And what do you uh -huh. do if, like, someone asks for information? No, no one's ever asked me that question, but yeah, I would definitely, so I would definitely, would be, yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, you just, yeah, you just people write papers on people suicide, write, yeah, right. or right. Right. suicide, 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 suicide,
sometimes they come and ask questions, and I think it's to, to try to shock them, um, which they didn't succeed in. But <laughs> And, and the reason, and the reason we're bringing this up, it really is because you are going to have students who are going to ask you questions, and they're not going to tell you anything, but still you have to help them. And you're going to have students who come to you, and if you ask them a question, and this is a little later, they're going to yell at you. Oh, it's going to happen, especially when it gets later into these into these phases. If you ask the wrong question, and if it get, hits on a sensitive topic, they're going to yell. Because it's a sensitive enough topic that you're asking a question that you have no right asking them. And it gets, in, as their identity development, it gets less as their identity develops. But we have a large amount of students who are stuck right here, right now. And this is yelling world for students when it comes to their pride phase. Because what happens is in stages four and five, they, anything that is, anyone who is perceived or thought to be heterosexual asking them a question about their identity is seen as them. How dare they ask me a question? And it's this us-them establishment type thing. Um, and it's because they're, they very much are self... Um, they're aware of who they are. And they are very proud of who they are. But the establishments are traditionally heteronormative. And, they, and so what happens is they get stuck in this... Um, structure of having to explain who they are all the time to people. And they get tired of it. And so when you ask them a question, they'll explode. It's not about you. It's just where they are at that point in time. Um, and, the, and it may happen. And then you may have to diffuse it and say, well, you know, I just I need to ask you, I just need to, ha I just need to have a question um, answered. Um, and usually what will happen is if they may come to you with some good ideas at that point in time, too. It's not going to say it's going to all be doom and gloom. With them, they may come in good with good ideas. They may ask you to take all things. They may come to the library and say, "Well, can't you just create a gay and lesbian section?" Wouldn't that make it like much easier on me? And your answer to that would have to be depending on what you decided to do, not on them, but on them. But they'll come with some ideas of how things, how the how as an establishment, groups can work with them. Um, and so that's, those are the types of things that will happen really here. And most of our students are about right here. We have, quite a, few, we have a few up here. This, is about, this is, usually happens now, though, about 14 to 16. So we're not dealing with this as much in college anymore. Most students are coming out at about age 14 to 16. So by the time we get them, they're here in their identity acceptance and their pride phase. They're so excited about who they are. It's what I call I'm here, I'm queer face. You know, the rainbow flags were good to go. You see those on the movies. That's what's happening about right here. And they'll begin to tell everybody, hey, I'm gay. I saw, it was great. I was walking across campus the other day and I said, um, I saw a hat and a woman says, hey mom, I'm, and the hat says, hey mom, I'm gay. I was like, I want that hat. Just because. And I was like, did you get it? Just so you wouldn't have to tell your mom and you could just wear it and it could deal with it. But those types of things. But what, all of the things that we're helping, though, is really to move them towards step six. And just by listening and talking to them and helping them is really will help a person towards stage six. And it's really identity synthesis. And identity synthesis really is about, yeah, I'm gay. Got it. But there's many other parts to me. And it's this whole thing of what we go through in life. Of there are other parts to me that are important. Um, yeah, and I just happen to be gay. So what? Okay. It's this thing of I'm this and this and this and this. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention I just happen to be. It's not the first thing that comes up. Some, some students in this phase, if you ask them, hi, it's like, hi, my name is and I'm gay. It's like the second or third thing that's out of their mouth. It's not so much here. It's not the core of their identity at this point. It's still important, but it's not the core. And it begins to really, they really begin to understand how supportive um, Everyone needs to be in this standpoint. 
All right, now let me help you understand this fun thing. Let's talk about the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. Sexual orientation is, for all intents and purposes, if I just use the letters LGBT or the LG and the B, lesbian, the gay, and the bisexual. It's who are you romantically attracted to, who you are sexually attracted to, emotionally and affectionately attracted to. And there's a continuum that this, that this happens on. Okay? So, the Ken Kenzie did his first original research on this very issue. Kenzie's scale um, basically says no one's, in its simplest form, no one's 100% heterosexual and no one's 100% homosexual. Okay? That's basically Kenzie's scale. But, it says you fluctuate. It does not mean, though, that you wake up one day and you were heterosexual and all of a sudden you jump over here. That's not what happens. You fluctuate within this end of the spectrum. You're never 100% right here at the end. And if you're right here in the middle as bisexual, you fluctuate within a margin within that middle section. And same thing happens for people who identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. You, I mean, as lesbian or gay, you kind of fluctuate in this end. It doesn't um, mean that you're going to completely jump. You're just going to fluctuate within your ends of the spectrum. Um, now, gender identity, which is T, which we're going to get to in a minute with transgender, um, is your idea of being masculine, feminine, male, female, um, or something else. And basically it's internal. It's not something you can see. It's the how do you identify. Do you identify as male or female? And these two things are very different. Um, one thing I want you to understand is these two are irrespective of one another. These two do not determine one another. This, people who have, who are, have a gender identity and whatever their gender identity is can have a completely separate sexual orientation. So if you are a male, we're going to get into this in just a second. So if you are a male that identifies as a female and you have a sex change, okay? You may or may not have one, but let's say you did. Your sexual orientation can be identified as straight, bisexual, lesbian, pansexual, you know, all those other things. So that, those are irrespective of one another. And too many times people, because LGBT is said together, they just go and lump it all together. So, the lovely transgender umbrella. Let's explain this. Transgender umbrella, it is just a big umbrella. When I say the word transgender, it covers a lot of different terms. Now, do all people who are under this umbrella use the word transgender to identify themselves? No. First and foremost, let me get that straight. When we say transgender, usually what is being identified is transsexual. And I'm going to identify what transgender and transsexual, how, the, how that's different. Transgender is someone who is anatomy and how they feel are in conflict with one another. So how you feel and what's in your pants are in conflict with one another. That's a good way to think of it. Okay? Those two things don't match up. Transgender individuals can either be, can either go and have surgery to f make those two things line up Trans that would be a transsexual. Or they can choose not to. So they can dress um, as the opposite sex or um, however they choose to identify, however they choose to um, play that out. Now transsexuals have, you'll hear sometimes M2F or F2M or MTF, FTM, male to female, uh, um, male to female, um, female to male. What that basically means is just the first letter is the sex they were at birth and the last letter is the sex that they're going to be when the surgery is complete. Okay? That's what that means. So what happens is 
at that point in time, um, these people have elected to have their surgery. It is more expensive for a female to transition to a male than it is for a male to transition to a female. Anybody have any idea why that would be? You have to create skin on a female. You already have the skin you need on a male. We won't go any further than that. Um, so that's, that's the basic idea of it. Now, otherwise, though, intersex gets, crossed, gets put under this. Um, cross-dressers get put under this group. Now, cross-dressers are people who like to wear clothing of the opposite sex. Who are predominantly cross-dressers? So, men or women? Men. Gay or straight? Straight. 95% of, of uh, cross-dressers are straight men. They're straight. Their identity is straight. So they're straight heterosexual men, and they and they do this in the confines of their own home. They don't do this. They don't go out in public. I mean, they may wear some clothing under their clothes in public, but nothing external. And then you have gender benders and androgynies. These are people who, when you look at them for all intents and purposes, you don't know if they're men or women. They balk at the traditional idea of gender stereotypes. They balk at the idea of boys play with Tonka trunks and girls play with Barbie. That's done work for them. And they've had that problem their entire life. Some people will call to these people tomboys, you know, all those types of things. Yeah, it's not really correct, but some people will get into that. And then you have performers. <coughs> Performers are gay men or lesbian women who are, and they're considered drag kings or drag queens, and they know very much who they are sexually and who they are um, in every way, shape, or form, men or women, and they do it to, for monetary purposes. They usually get some money out of it, or just for fun. Sometimes they do it just for fun. And they're really good at what they do. I'm going to tell you that. Um, imitating the opposite sex. They're really good at that. Um, and some, most of them don't identify as transgender. Most of them just say, I'm a drag king or I'm a drag queen. Um, so there's inherent problems with this whole umbrella concept, but that's how this has come into being and how it's come into being expl um, explained. Um, so, questions about that before I go on? We got it. All right. So why should we care? LGBT students on campus. Four to ten percent of the U.S. population identify as LGBT, and one percent of the of campus or of the American population identify as transgender. Here at UNCG, fourteen percent of our undergraduate population self-identify as LGBT. If you want to break it down, that's about one out of every seven of our undergraduate students. Um, and and I put, oh, excuse me, LGBTQ, not T. The T, I'm getting data on now, questioning. The T, I'm not quite sure on yet. I can just give you anecdotal data. Um, I would bet that it's probably 1%. Um, and the reason is UNCG has a very welcoming, open environment, um, and a lot of students transfer here. And a lot of students come here for the very reason of um, our reputation as being an open and welcoming environment. Now, with that being said, the way, when I started realizing, I already knew that, but I started realizing a lot more with our transgender population. When I was at SOAR in January and I met five transgender students transferring here, it's very rare to meet five transgender students in one location at the same time. And they were all at the same source session. So we have a very open atmosphere for students here at this campus. So just to let you know. Okay. Why do we worry about it also? 
Well, it can't, they can be invisible because a lot of students who are LGBT, unless they tell you, you don't know about it. Um, that's an issue for retention and recruitment as well. So if students are leaving, why are they leaving? I mean, yeah, we get a large number of students who are LGBT, but what about the ones who leave? Why did they leave? And we have no way of knowing that. Um, and then we have this hate and this isms issue. I'm going to give you a profile of a student. Very simple profile. And I want you to identify to me everything this person's dealing with just from the profile. Okay? Don't use your imagination any more than what I tell you. Okay? Because there's a lot of other things that could go on with this person. But let's just give you this. This person is a female. She is African American. Adult student. Lesbian. Um, science major. What's she dealing with? Name all the isms and other words you can think. Oh, by the way, she also happens to be very religious. Tell me everything that she's dealing with. And her, tell me everything that, that she's potentially dealing with. Use an ism or another word that explains it. Racism, sexism. Racism, sexism. Heterosexism. You got three of them. Keep going. Religion, potentially. Yep. Keep going. Yeah, well, that whole science thing. Male dominated profession idea. Yep. Keep going. No, we haven't said ageism. I didn't tell you how old she is, but that's a potential issue. Right. Okay, and I didn't tell you whether she had a family or any of the other stuff. that she, Maybe she got laid off or anything. I didn't tell you any of that other stuff. So this is just what you can name just from what I told you that she's potentially dealing with. And the point of making that is with the hate and the isms, no student, just like none of you in here, have one identity. <laughs> you all have multiple identities. I'm not saying you're schizophrenic. I'm saying you have multiple identities. There's many things that make you who you are. And if all of those things that make you who you are can be attacked, that makes for a pretty rough road, right? And we have to think about those things when we're helping a student. And in, the student may be coming to you. Let's talk about, let's, let's use a student's coming to you and asking you a question. Let's say it's even a student employee who comes to you and asks you a question. Okay? Don't out, even if you know that the student is gay, lesbian, however they identify, don't automatically assume it's because of that that's the, that is the issue. We have a lot of people who automatically jump to that as being their major concern. It could be any of those other things that we just listed. Um, so that's one of those other things to think about. How, how do these things intersect? And, you know, in an hour, I just can't get into all of that. But how do all of those things intersect? And how do those multiple identities come into play? So let me look at homonegativity really quick. Homonegativity is the umbrella term that basically is any, any attitude or discriminatory behavior that's towards homosexuals or homosexuality. And that includes homophobia, which is an aversion to gay or homosexual people or lifestyle or culture. Um, and it's basically an irrational fear of homosexuality. And heterosexism is this belief that heterosexual, heterosexuality um, is normal. It's the only natural option um, that exists and that heterosexuality is superior. Um, and it is what should occur. I'm going to skip this for a second and come back. What happens is in, in cultures that create um, homonegative cultures, um, and you can be, if you don't watch what you say, these can get, um, you know, give me an example of a word that potentially you could slip and use in your everyday life that create, that one student could hear and they would automatically label you as homonegative. Gay being, stupid. Gay being stupid. Right, keep going. Something even less intricate than that. Confused. Confused. Yeah. They're just confused. Lifestyle or choice. Right. Lifestyle or choice. If, and, and that's the biggest one that our students complain about. Well, the gay lifestyle. Culture, maybe? Lifestyle, no. My other favorite is agenda. 
Our students get that one a lot. I was like, okay, great. I'm going to give you a real, and let me tell you about my gay agenda. Wake up, brush my teeth, take a shower. Anybody really excited about that agenda? And there's this thought that there's something underlying there. So that can happen. And you can create a culture of fear and distrust. And this idea that no one wants to work with you. And you're more than. And it divides groups. Um, other factors is you can create in, within students um, or within yourself this idea of self-doubt. Um, isolation. Even students will begin to start having issues of trying to be heterosexual. I'm going to tell you, if you've ever watched a student who's been struggling with that, and they know that they're gay, that is some inner turmoil that will tear a student apart. I'm working with one right now. Um, they can't function socially or academically. They start being, they have self-hatred, so they hate themselves because of who they are. So, and they become self-destructive as a way of coping. One thing, I'll tell you a simple indicator if you're ever working with students to look at. Look at times when it's time to go home. And this is really interesting, and you'll notice this more with your student employees, or you may notice it when students are just talking to you in passing. Look at times when it's time for students to go home for like holidays or the end of the semester, and if they are dreading it so much, this does not mean this is necessarily the case, but it can be a result of the home environment, and a lot of our students who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, their parents are not so keen on the idea that their students are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Some of their students have been um, disowned and have been kicked out of their homes at age 14. Um, so, some at 15, some at 16, some now. So, these are some of the things to start watching for when you're talking to a student. Let me go back and I'm going to show you this. Um, oh yes, we did something different. Um, this video kind of shows how working with students can get interesting and it shows the impact of homophobia on everybody.
Okay. One of the things with that um, is, you know, some were gay and some were transgender, but some were straight. And that's one of the biggest things is it doesn't matter how you identify. It can be a perception of an identity that also leads to a lot of this behavior. One thing that's happened is a lot of students have found their colleges and their um, universities unwelcoming, um, so they leave. And that's what I was talking to you about earlier, and we're going to look at that in just a second. Oh, let me try and actually go from this current slide. All right. So this gets me to safe spaces and what you guys, um, we have the bigger program and really what I'd like for to create in the library is an environment, it was started in 1992, so they're fairly new at Ball State University, um, and really create a place where students, faculty, and staff who identify as LGBT feel safe and welcome. They feel like they have a place to, li someone to listen to. Um, they have someone who can who values them, someone who is just there if they need them. And it doesn't have to be anything as elaborate as, you know, it can be just something as simple as listening. I mean, you don't have to know everything. I'm not expecting you to. It just be something, somebody to listen um, and someone who can be trusted. Um, to, if a student comes to you and says, hey, I think I may be gay, that you go, okay, and you listen to them. And you listen to their story. And it's their story. Remember that one thing. It's their story. It's, no one, it's not your story and it's no one else's story. That if, and don't go tell someone else. They'll tell someone when they're ready. And getting ready to close and then I'll take questions is remember to watch your definitions because they become your thoughts. And watch your thoughts because they become your words. Watch your words because they become your actions. And watch your actions because they really do become your destiny. And they become how people remember you. It only takes one person having a really bad experience with you for everyone else to find out about it. And it becomes what everyone else will know about you, whether it's right or wrong. Um, it's what people say. And, okay, questions. I did it in a time frame that I was you told me. You know, I'm told an hour. I will get you in here in an hour. This really is a lot of information, and I really do encourage you to, if this is something you really, really, really want to go through, um, and I'm going to point to something in the packet in a second, our bigger safe zone training is really set up for that, and it's because it's an all-day training. I have no more space, unfortunately. November of next year will be our next available training. Um, However, you know, because I'm doing this again on Friday with much more in depth and a lot of different things. We're getting, actually, we're going to do a whole session on Friday that's an hour and a half long just on religion and LGBT issues. Um, so, you know, get, you know, get yourself involved if this is something that you're interested in. One of the things that um, I will point out to you. If you're interested in taking it, um, is the very last page. And this points to where you are currently in your development of working with LGBT people. It's called the Riddle Scale. I purposely didn't give you the scores. Because if I gave you the scores, you'd sit there and go, okay, hold on. How do I? And I've learned that. So I didn't give you the answers to this. But you can very easily Google Riddle, Riddle Scale, and it'll give you the answers to this. Basically, how you take this is you put a check in every state, in every box you agree with. You either agree with it or you don't agree with it. There's no sometimes in this situation, maybe kind of. You agree with it, you don't agree with it. And then you find which ones that have more checks, and you put a bracket around that set of numbers. And then, go online and look, and it's going to show you, are you tolerant, unable to work, or unable to work with people who are LGBT? And there's a whole continuum. 
And it's going to tell you what are things that are hindering you. Just by these little questions. So I recommend that that's something you take time to do for your own development and your own knowledge. Um, the other thing is, in addition to this coming out process, um, I didn't go into it because you all can read. You're very intelligent people. Um, there's a page on how homophobia and transphobia hurts everyone. Um, so you can look at that. Um, we went over a lot of that. And then what one can do. So this is what you can do. And if we've categorized it low risk, some risk, and get greater risk. So you can determine how willing you are to get involved. And it's okay right now if you want to say low risk. That's fine. Low risk is better than nothing at all, right? So you can do low risk. And one of them is inform yourself about lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people and about homophobia. Well, you know, the lowest risk is pretty much what you do. Journals, books, that type of stuff. That's the lowest risk because you're not actively out in the community and things like that. So that's its lowest risk. Um, now, to actually go out and attend allies meetings, going to like meetings with the Pride organization and things like that, now that takes you putting yourself out there a little more. And that's a little more risk. Um, and then actually engaging people in conversations about homophobia, now that takes a little more risk. So, and challenging people on that, that takes a little more risk. So, I want you to look at this and you determine where you are on this. I'm not going to tell you where you are or where you need to be because you know that and you know where you are at this point in time. But I just gave you something so you can kind of look and determine what you can do at this point in time. And, do remember that you can do something. Okay?